All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the land of Kem. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. I uh, gotta admit, I'm pretty excited <laughs> to be back to making videos again. Uh, I apologize about the hiatus between the previous video and this one. Had a lot of very, very exciting projects going on, um, some top secret stuff that I will be releasing very, very soon, and also had a return trip to Egypt two months ago in November of 2020. It feels like it's been years already since I got back, but uh, not too long ago. And I was there doing research for the material that would be contained in the second book in the Land of Chem series. So the first one is your initiation into ancient chemistry through the degrees of the Egyptian pyramids. And then the subsequent books will have some more um, involved details, let's put it that way, um, because these structures are not straightforward whatsoever. So let's just get right into it. Again, thank you so much for joining me. This is episode four covering the second degree, which is the second chapter in the book on the function of the red pyramid. So without any further ado, let's get right into it. And of course, as always, for those of you that are interested, uh, my social media plug, the website, www.thelandofchem.com. And of course, follow me on Instagram <laughs> at the land of chem. We can cover that more here later, but moving right along. Okay, so to recap from episode three, covering the function of the step pyramid, if you wanna watch the video to get the full details, it's on the uh, YouTube channel, check that out. I'll try to put a link below if I can remember to do so. But um, long story short, just gonna give a quick review of the material that we covered. All right, so the step pyramid, I believe, and as is contained within the book, that the step pyramid was designed to produce methane gas. So on the left side here, we have a diagram of the step pyramid and you have three major components. We're gonna keep this short and sweet. You have the inlet shaft coming in from the northern side of the structure. Underneath the six tiered pyramid, you have the primary digestion chamber or your main methane fermentation tank, however you wanna call it. And then leading out to the south, you have your displacement shaft through which the decomposed substrate material is collected after the methane production cycle um, has finished. So again, you have this northern inlet shaft, central digestion chamber, displacement shaft leading out from the south. And that is exactly what you see here on the right in these diagrams of methane digestion chambers. You have your inlet shaft leading into the primary digestion chamber, you have your displacement shaft leading out of the structure, and then you have your mixing pit where your uh, raw material substrate slurry is created. And in the case of the step pyramid, the raw materials were, of course, cattle manure, and you would have had agricultural scrap material that was collected after the harvesting season. And of course, water from the flooded Nile River was used to create this slurry, which was then introduced into the primary digestion chamber through your northern inlet shaft. The anaerobic bacteria that are contained within the cattle manure are the genesis for this chemical reaction. Um, and as those bacteria start digesting the material, they create a mixture of gases from the raw materials, uh, which is mainly methane, CH4. So you're extracting the carbon and hydrogen from the raw materials, and then the bacteria are converting it into methane gas within the anaerobic <clears throat> conditions inside the chamber. And after that process is complete, your decomposed substrate material is again removed from the structure through the displacement shaft. So that is step one in the series of Egyptian chemical manufacturing structures, which are the Great Pyramids, uh, the Step Pyramid, Red Pyramid, Bent Pyramid, and then onto the Giza Pyramids. Of course, the material contained within the land of Chem is that these structures were all used to create chemicals on an industrial scale. So the first degree covers the function of the step pyramid, of course, producing methane gas. And then we move on to the second degree covering the function of the step pyramid, which is one of my particular favorites. Obviously the logo uh, for the book and the, the logo on the t-shirts is the red pyramid, the 45, 45, 90 degree triangle with two molecules on the inside. For any of you that are even reasonably familiar with chemistry, you'll probably recognize 
which molecules these are, and you can determine what chemical was being produced inside the structure. So again, let's get right to it. I love this picture. And this is from the Land of Chem 2020 research expedition. So this is a very recent photo from our trip to Saqqara. And you can see over here on the right, the stepped pyramid, and in the distance, the red and bent pyramids of Dashur. So these structures are not only physically connected below the landscape via systems of subterranean shafts that move the chemicals from one structure to the other, they're also visually connected on the landscape. And when you're at the step pyramid, you can see the red and bent pyramids. Looking back from Dashur, you can see the step pyramid to the north. And then looking in the other direction, you can see the pyramids of Abu Sir and the pyramids of Giza even further to the north. So they are again visually connected on the landscape and also connected uh, subterranean um, with shafts that link each structure for the transportation of chemicals. So here's just another great photo. Again, this is from the 2020 Land of Chem Research Expedition. You see the red pyramid here on the left. And then if you look here kind of in the cloudy distance, you can see the step pyramid to the north. And so I just wanted to share this quote. Um, so again, the land of chem is a fictional story about a young man's initiation into ancient chemistry. And he's being initiated into this ancient secret society called the Order of Chem that was responsible for the construction and operation of the Egyptian pyramids. And through each degree, he is given the true purpose of each structure. And so again, there's this fictional story that goes along with it. And I just wanted to share kind of a part of that fictional story. And then a bit further in the presentation, I will share kind of how the technical details are presented within the narrative. Because it's kind of two separate things. Um, so anyway, <laughs> the view from the platform was exquisite. The red pyramid ablaze with moonlight resembled the apex of a giant shining crystal rising out from underneath the ground. From this position, a quarry could still see the step pyramid to the north and envision the methane being produced there flowing through the subterranean shaft below the landscape. And that's kind of what you can see in that previous picture is that young Aquari, our initiate, is watching from this platform and he can see the step pyramid to the north and he's envisioning the, the production cycle occurring and these chemicals flowing underground. Uh, so really my main intention with the fictional story was just to kind of paint the picture of what was really happening with these structures. And it's something that's kind of personally familiar to me. <laughs> I won't go into detail on that. Um, maybe at a later date, I will um, reveal all the secrets as to where this kind of plot line came up. Um, again, here is another, move myself out of the way. <laughs> I love this picture. It is absolutely spectacular. So the day we went to Dashur, it had actually rained in, in Egypt, in Cairo and Giza that night and the previous night. Um, so it was a very, very unique and rare thing to see is rain in Egypt. So the day we went to Dashur, it was super cloudy, still a little bit of rain coming down. So we got some really, really amazing pictures from that tour day. Um, again, this is absolutely amazing. I love this. You see the red pyramid here in the front and then the bent pyramid in the distance to the south. And if you look here on the north side of the structure, you can actually see the little entrance and there's a little hut or shack or whatever you wanna call it here at the top of the stairs. And you go in on the northern side here and you'll see that in another picture. But just to give you an idea of the scale of these structures, they are absolutely immense and it's, it's really wild <laughs> to see these things in person. And then to be able to climb inside them, and again, you immediately get the sense upon entering these structures that human beings were never intended to go inside there, again, that they were intended for more of an industrial type purpose. And you really get that sense as soon as you go inside the bent pyramid. And it becomes very, very clear that this was not intended as a burial structure whatsoever. Again, it had sort of a, a manufacturing purpose as evidenced by the intense chem chemical smell of ammonia that still remains in the chambers and the staining all over the walls. Um, there had been some discussion in my previous videos with Alan from the Sacred Geometry Decoded channel that the staining on the walls of the chambers and the smell is a result of the bats. Well, I can now conclusively say, having investigated four other structures that had bats inside it, including the Bent Pyramid, including uh, Mastaba 17 at the Pyramid of Maidum, 
couple of other structures. The Pyramid of My Doom actually had some bats in there too. There's absolutely no chemical staining on the walls and there is no smell of ammonia in any of those structures. Um, so that is a complete fallacy that anyone claims that the staining in these chambers is caused by the bats is simply not the case. Um, and now again, the conclusive evidence of that having investigated several of the other structures in Egypt. I love this picture. This is again of the Bent Pyramid's northeastern corner. And again, you can kind of get that imagery of the giant shining crystal rising out from underneath the ground. A lot of this fictional narrative comes directly from my experiences visiting Egypt and what I saw and what I felt the first time that I was there in 2017. And some of the pictures in this presentation are actually from that 2017 trip. This is another one from the 2020 trip. And again, you can see here the little shack on the northern face that we actually descend into the structure from this little shack. And again, this just gives you an idea of the scale of the structure. You see here these little trash barrels on the left side give you an idea of how big a person would be standing next to the structure. It's absolutely immense and really, really cool to be able to see these things in person. I feel very fortunate, especially considering the circumstances of last year that we were able to go um, in November and it was really a, a magical experience. Why is this going backwards now? All right. So here we go. Again, I apologize. I'm moving myself back and forth just to get out of the way. This is a picture of <laughs> Yusuf, uh, our guide uh, and our friend now in Egypt. Man, Yusuf is the absolute best. And I cannot thank him enough for showing us the mysteries of the Egyptian pyramids and just treating us like like friends and family, and we really felt that during this last trip. But this is a picture of Yusuf and me on our way into the Red Pyramid for the first time in 2017. So this picture is well, almost four years old now. So, but again, you can get the idea of the scale. There's this long stairway leading up. You go all the way up the northern face up to this little guard shack or whatever you want to call it, and then you descend into the northern shaft. But again, this is my first journey inside the Red Pyramid which inspired all of, the, all of the chemistry and all of the investigation that I was doing into the physics. It's all about simple physics. And particularly with this structure, it is manipulation of volume of water and soluble gases that causes a change in the temperature and pressure of those gases, which facilitates a chemical reaction series. And again, we'll get into that um, right now, actually. Okay, so this is a schematic of the Red Pyramid. And there are a few things that I wanna point out here. The first thing being the reservoir around the structure. Okay, so we learned in the first degree that the pyramids of Egypt were designed to operate in conjunction with the annual Nile River flooding. So the river would flood. This is at the end of the harvesting season. So you have all of your agricultural scrap materials and your cattle manure collected to produce the methane gas. Methane production cycle begins, and you also have all of your other chemicals being produced during this Aket season, the season of the flood, so that they would be prepared in advance for the upcoming harvesting season. So it was all cyclical. Um, as with life in general, you know, everything uh, operates on a cycle, and the same was very much um, applicable for the uh, ancient Egyptians. And again, I do believe this is the pre-dynastic Egyptians, because then we had that pharaonic civilization come along later. Um, but again, even the, the pre-dynastic Egyptians would have had that similar cycle of the flood, the harvesting, um, the collection season, and then again, the flooding again. So first and foremost, the reservoir surrounding the structure or this enclosure. Um, there is some evidence that all of these structures or all of the reservoirs around the structures were 33 feet, 11 meters. And that is going to be applicable in the function of this structure. We're gonna be talking about some uh, Pascal's principles in terms of fluid dynamics. And we'll cross that bridge here in just a little bit, but just keep that in mind. The enclosure or reservoir surrounding the structure was 33 feet high. Now here on the Eastern side of the Red Pyramid, you see this little uh, satellite structure, which is actually going to be your reservoir intake valve. So your reservoir would have been filled with water. And this structure on the side is again your intake valve, which allowed water to enter the internal structure and begin filling the chambers. So we've got that covered. 
and the three chambers inside the red pyramid are all geometrically similar. You have your first two chambers aligned north to south, and then your final synthesis chamber is aligned east to west. They are all geometrically similar in terms of having a rectangular lower half and then an upper vault portion that converges in regular intervals. So it gets smaller and smaller and smaller toward the top of the chamber. And again, that was meticulous engineering, right? With progressively reduced volume toward the apex of the vault which again was re reducing the volume of the gases, increasing temperature and pressure to facilitate a chemical reaction. So I think that's all I wanted to cover on this particular schematic. So one thing you also have here is your northern shaft, which is gonna be your northern pump shaft. And there's also some evidence that there is a shaft that leads out of this final synthesis chamber. Um, they've done some excavations in that final chamber, which indicate that they were looking for a shaft. It appears to me that the shaft goes right out of the bottom of the pit. And again, there's some evidence that that, that may be the case. So to recap again, well, I jumped way ahead here. Hold on, let me go back. Okay. So again, keeping this design in mind, you've got the reservoir around the structure, 33 feet high. You have your reservoir intake valve within the reservoir, which let the water into the structure. You have your northern pump shaft and then your outlet shaft coming out of the final synthesis chamber. Uh, oh, maybe that is the next slide. All right. So nonetheless, um, I just wanted to share this picture. I think I might've mentioned this in the previous video. This is the picture of one of the original apparatus used to produce ammonia. And you will see here, there are some very interesting similarities between this apparatus and the chambers of the Red Pyramid. Again, let me get myself out of the way here. So you can see, this is the most important thing is the configuration of the Red Pyramid. But you'll see here, this original apparatus had three different chambers connected by a system of shafts. And that is exactly what you have here in the Red Pyramid. One, two, three chambers connected by a system of shafts, which were used to link each chamber. And I do believe that the configuration of this original apparatus used to produce ammonia was designed to pay homage to the place from whence it came. Again, this apparatus could have been created in any sort of configuration. They didn't have to raise this upper chamber above the other two, which is exactly what you see here in the configuration of the Red Pyramid, that the third and final synthesis chamber is slightly elevated above the other two. That's exactly what you see here on the left in this apparatus that was used to produce ammonia. And again, the modern process for producing this chemical is basically the same, but we have higher temperature, higher pressure, using electricity mostly to facilitate these chemical reactions. And one thing I am not implying is that this ancient chemical manufacturing process is any way comparable to the efficiency or output of what we have today, right? Um, the temperature wasn't as high, the pressure wasn't as high, the conversion rate wouldn't have been as efficient, your um, product would not have been as pure, you wouldn't have as much of a product. But again, the whole point is that it is possible and that they were doing this and they were producing the chemicals. Again, was it as efficient as what we have today? No, definitely wasn't. But it's still pretty amazing that they were to able to accomplish this miraculous chemistry utilizing very, very simple physics. And again, that's one of the biggest just sort of revelations about the Egyptian pyramids is that they encode all of this ancient knowledge and ancient science within it's a harmonious composition of interdisciplinary ancient sciences. And I'm like, I'm quoting myself out of the book. But um, yeah, so that's like a quote from the fourth degree or something, a symphony of interdisciplinary ancient sciences. <laughs> but that's what they were. And um, again, they utilize this knowledge of physics to create chemical reactions on a large scale. Again, this was a massive civilization. It very much makes sense to me that they would have been in producing chemicals on an industrial scale to support their thriving agriculture and ind industry um, throughout the area. So let's keep on rolling here. All right, so to give you a little background on how ammonia is produced industrially today, the first step in the process is conversion of your methane via steam reforming. 
So the methane is being produced in the step pyramid. The methane is transported from the step pyramid to the red pyramid and introduced into the first chamber. And again, this is your steam reformer, your primary steam reformer, where the water and the methane will react to produce carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So how does that happen? Um, one thing again to keep in mind are these Pascal's principles and the main one being that water will always rise to its level. It will always find its level regardless of the shape of the container um, that it is inside. So that's exactly what's gonna happen inside the red pyramid is that as the water from the reservoir enters the internal structure, it will only fill as high as the water level in the external reservoir. And that is where your northern pump shaft is utilized to help push, um, well, we'll get into that into the function of the final chamber, but just something to keep in mind are Pascal's principles. And also um, the same principles that were utilized in designing a hydraulic press, the incompressible nature of liquids, that if you press on a liquid, you're gonna distribute that force simultaneously to all points within it. That's actually utilized in the function of the uh, vent pyramid, but we'll cover that in a future video. So Pascal's principle. Okay, so looking at this, and let me give credit here to the Aceta project, um, the original schematic here produced by Frank Monnier. Um, visit the Aceta project website if you're looking to check out some pictures or some diagrams. They actually toured with Yusuf, our same guide. Um, they're just an exceptional research group and I give a lot of credit to them. And I always like to give credit where credit's due if some of these pictures are not my own. And of course, this diagram is not mine. So again, let's remember that diagram depicting the exterior of the red pyramid. Remember that that external reservoir is 33 feet high. So the height of these first chambers is 40 feet. So the highest that that water level will ever be able to reach within the first two chambers is 33 feet. And then you'll have seven feet until the top of the chamber. So that's just something to keep in mind. So step number one is begin to fill the primary chamber. So your external reservoir intake valve is opened. This allows water from the reservoir to begin flowing into the chambers. And I'm gonna show you an old picture that you can actually see them here, that there are some holes depicting in this diagram. There's a hole here near the shaft that leads from the first chamber to the second chamber. There's a hole here in the floor on the southern side of the second chamber. And I believe those are your drainage shafts and we'll get into that here in just a minute. So step number one, again, open up your reservoir valve, water from the reservoir moves into chambers. And what it's gonna do is start filling these first two chambers. And the first step is raise the water level to the height of the connecting shaft. So there's a connecting shaft that runs from the first chamber to the second chamber. And as you fill these first two chambers with water, water level will rise. It will reach the level of the top of that connecting shaft. And what you have done is isolate the remaining interior space of chamber one. It's essentially sealed with the water. So you're setting your initial temperature and pressure conditions within that chamber. Now, something to keep in mind, again, methane is a water insoluble gas. So the water is actually gonna act like a plunger. As the water level rises in the chamber, it is going to push that insoluble gas into the upper portion of the vault. Again, there's significantly reduced volume in this upper portion of the vault, which is going to increase temperature. It's going to increase pressure, which facilitates the chemical reaction process. So again, step number one, you're gonna start filling up the chamber. Step number two is introduce methane into the chamber. And there is a small hole, or I call it the, the shaft termination, on the northwestern face of the first chamber. And I'll show that here in just a sec. I believe that is where your methane was introduced into the chamber. The methane is going to start to fill the upper vault section. And then step number three is continue to raise the water level. And the third tier in the chamber is going to be the indicator mark for that third step in the process. Again, first you fill, to, uh, fill the shaft to isolate each of your chambers. You fill chamber one with methane. 
Step number three, continue to raise the water level up to the th third tier in the vault. And that's where you're gonna start to see the temperature and pressure increase start to uh, again, facilitate that chemical reaction. So what do you see here? This is the entrance to the first chamber inside the bent pyramid. And you'll see here on the left, it's actually been filled in with modern concrete, but there is a hole here. And I believe this is a shaft termination, your methane introduction shaft. And you'll see here that it's actually at the exact line of the top of the northern pump shaft, which leads into the chamber. And it actually is the same height as your connecting shaft that leads from the first chamber into the second chamber. And when you're standing inside here, you can see that there's actually a flow pattern of staining that leads up from this hole into the upper vault section. And again, you can see this kind of strange staining all over the walls. It's in very distinct patterns, which again, to me are kind of indications of the flow dynamics that were inside the structure. But uh, again, not the best picture in the world. I'll show you another one here in just a sec. So again, those are your first three steps. You're filling the water up to this level here, which is the height of that northern pump shaft coming in, same height as the shaft leading into the second chamber. And then you fill the water up even more, up to the one, two, three, the bottom of the third tier in the vault. And I'll show you what that looks like now. Okay, so again, this is a picture showing that same northern face of the first chamber inside the Red Pyramid. And this is from the Land of Chem 2017 research expedition. So this is my first journey inside the Red Pyramid. And you can see here that there is a very unusual transition in the pattern of the staining immediately at the base of that third tier. And again, that was an indication to me that that was um, kind of that marker of where the water level was increased during that third step in the reaction process. So again, you're pushing that methane into the converging portion of the vault, significantly reduce volume, increase temperature and pressure, which is gonna start that chemical reaction process. And again, you can see here, just kind of the staining on the walls of the chamber. And over here on the left side, you can see that inlet shaft, which I believe is again, your, your methane inlet shaft. All right, so here is a quote from the book. Again, let me move myself out of the way here. Again, the one reason I wanted to share these two quotes, um, one so that you could see kind of how the narrative was presented and how I worked my, my own experiences in Egypt into the book to kind of tell the story. But there's also this very technical presentation of, again, the details of the chemical uh, reaction process and exactly how these structures operated. So a query realized that as the water level rose in the reformer, it would act like a plunger pushing up on the gas, pressing it into the converging portion of the vault. The concentration of the molecules and their rate of collision in this uppermost section would be higher, improving the efficiency of the reaction. Brother Julius continued, the water level is raised a third time up to the eighth tier. The upper vaults within the chambers of the Red Pyramid were meticulously engineered with progressively reduced volume towards the apex. And as the methane is compressed into this area of the primary steam reformer, the temperature and pressure of the gas increase. Um, so again, Brother Julius is conferring this knowledge, again, of the specific step-by-step -step operation of each structure. And again, he's the senior member of the fraternity who's initiating this young man into the secrets of the Egyptian pyramids. So again, you have this kind of fictional narrative, but then also these very technical details that are contained within that narrative. And um, again, something that's very personally familiar to me for a number of reasons. Uh, and we'll probably cross that bridge at a later date. And I don't know what's going on with the video. It seems like all sorts of different colors are popping up. The sun's going down. <laughs> so bear with me on any technical details in this one. It's been a while since I've recorded. So I just wanted to get back on here and have some fun. And it seems like I might be able to get through this entire one unedited. <laughs> so again, just a little quote. And this is again, how Brother Julius presents the material to a query. So you have an idea of how those technical details are described within the book. 
All right, so I think I talked about this in one of my previous videos. Uh, anytime I get super excited, I don't have any idea what to do with my hands. So I just throw my hands up in the air. <laughs> like, yeah. So anyway, my victory pose. And anytime you see me doing that, you know that I'm just super stoked and I have no idea what to actually do with these things. So I just throw your hands up in the air. All right, but this picture is from the Land of Chem 2020 research expedition to Egypt. Again, rocking the, uh, got to always stay on brand, right? <laughs> but it was really, really cool experience to be able to wear this shirt, which again, depicts the operations of the Red Pyramid and the chemical that was being produced inside there. To be able to wear this inside the Red Pyramid and have pictures, it was very, it's just a really, really special moment for me. Again, this trip was kind of the culmination of a bunch of events that happened into 2020. And uh, again, just feel very blessed. And it was a miraculous experience as traveling to Egypt always is. But nonetheless, okay, so to recap, and again, I apologize if I reiterate some of these things over and over again, but I wanna make sure that you understand the technical details. And it also <laughs> helps me stay on track in terms of where the hell I am in this video. So again, step number one, you're gonna fill the chamber up to the height of the connecting shaft. So the water level is gonna fill up to here. Right. And again, this is going to isolate the interior space of chamber one and the interior space of chamber two. Step number two, you introduce methane. So the methane begins to start filling the chamber. Step number three, so you're going to raise that water level up and you're going to press that methane into the converging portion of the vault. And you can see here, again, this picture is very, very clear the distinct transition that happens precisely at the bottom of the third tier. Again, there was some argument that says that this staining was created by smoke. A, you do not want to be inside a closed structure with an entire converging vault portion filled with smoke. Um, you wouldn't last very long inside there. Also, this is not, this is not smoke damage. It's really, really clear when you go inside the structures. And again, the fact that there's that precise transition right at the bottom of the third tier is an indication more of function than of anything else. So again, you're compressing that methane up to the third tier. The next step, as I mentioned in the quote, you're gonna press it up to the eighth tier. And there's a very specific reason for that eighth tier because as you reach the eighth tier in the vault, the water level inside the chamber has reached the height of the water level in the exterior reservoir and it cannot go any higher unless you manually manipulate that water level. And we're gonna see that here in just a moment, but again, that's why I wanted to mention those Pascal principles is because again, water is always gonna reach its level regardless of the shape of the container. So you have 33 feet worth of water on the exterior of the structure, and you're gonna be able to get 33 feet worth of height of water inside the structure. But again, that can be manually manipulated, which is exactly what we see here in the function of the red pyramid. So you'll also notice and I'll show this in the subsequent photo, there is a very significant staining pattern that moves from the upper portion of this first chamber and it moves down into this connecting shaft. So let's get to chamber number two. Okay, so again, we have that methane compressed into the upper portion of the vault in this primary steam reformer. You're gonna have an increase in temperature and an increase in pressure which is gonna cause that surface layer of water to begin to transform into steam, which is the second chemical ingredient in this phase of the chemical reaction cycle. So your methane, CH4, is gonna react with your water, H2O, to produce hydrogen and carbon monoxide. So hydrogen being one of your um, desired reactants, carbon monoxide being one of your side products, which we'll get rid of that in the second stage of the reaction cycle. So again, you have these high pressure gases confined within the upper portion of the first chamber. And then the next step in the process, after that chemical conversion is completed, producing your hydrogen and carbon monoxide, you're gonna to start to lower that water level. And what they did was lower it just below the height of this connecting shaft, which creates a small aperture leading from the first chamber into the second chamber and your water is drained out of the hole in the floor in the second chamber. So again, there's fluid dynamics 
involved in the operation of this structure, that as the water is draining from the first chamber, it's also flowing out of the hole in the second chamber. So it's drawing the high pressure gases that are in the first chamber through into the lower pressure section of the second chamber. And again, those fluid dynamics as the water drains out of the chamber, again, it's moving from the first chamber and draining out of the second chamber. So the movement of that water is also gonna facilitate the movement of the gases into the second chamber. And I also believe that this damage here uh, above the connecting shaft it has something to do with the operation of the structure. This to me does not look like um, a man-made crack. It looks like something that was created because of high pressure or something of that nature. And again, it's you'll see in this original picture that, um, oh, where are we going here? Hold on, bear with me. All right. So, where was I? Okay, so moving into the function of the second chamber. All right, so you got that aperture. It allows high pressure gases to move into the lower pressure section. And again, the fluid dynamics, the water moving and draining into the second chamber is kind of what pulls those gases into the second chamber. And you can see here in the upper portion of the vault of the first chamber that the staining is much more concentrated on the southern side of the chamber. You will see the same thing in the second chamber that the concentration of the staining is mostly on the southern wall. And then you see the same thing in the final synthesis chamber. There's actually very, very little staining on the eastern wall of the chamber and significant amount of staining on the western wall of the chamber, which kind of again is an indication that there was a flow dynamic moving through the structure and that the gases were moving on the southern side of each one of these chambers. And that's exactly what you see in terms of the chemical reaction process. All right, so this is the old photo that I was talking about uh, where you can really see this staining pattern that moves from the upper vault portion through this connecting shaft into the second chamber. And this is pretty evident when you're inside the structure, you can really see it. It depends on the lighting conditions and how your camera picks it up, but you can, again, really see it in this old photo. Again, you see it moving. You can see that pattern moving from the upper portion of the vault, pushing through that shaft system into the second chamber. You can also see there's some, some wild staining on the lower portion of, of the walls that, um, again, are kind of indication of flow dynamics. You can see here that it does appear that there's some holes in the floor. And this is now all covered up with wooden planks. So when you go inside the structure, you're walking on wood. You can't actually see what's on the floor underneath you. So again, there are some indications that there are uh, other shafts leading out from the bottom of these chambers. Um, one of them, again, would be your reservoir fill shaft that fills the structure. One of them in the second chamber would be your drainage shaft. And again, there are some indications that there's a shaft leading out of the third chamber, which would be your collection shaft. I really, really like this old photo um, because again, it really indicates that flow dynamics. And this is one of the things that kind of got my wheels turning in terms of discovering how this structure really operated. So again, recap that first chamber, you're converting your methane and water into hydrogen and carbon monoxide using manipulations of temperature and pressure by compressing um, the insoluble gases into that reduced volume area of the first chamber. Very similar operation in the second portion. So again, what you have coming out of this first chamber is going to be your carbon monoxide and your hydrogen. And the second chamber is going to be your secondary air reformer. So the first chamber is your primary steam reformer your two products move into the second chamber, which is your secondary air reformer. And I will go into how that operates now. So again, now we're looking at this second chamber and we have our hydrogen and carbon monoxide products that were produced in the first chamber. So both of these gases are much lighter than air and they are going to rise into the upper portion of the chamber. So your gases are gonna float up into the upper vault and they're gonna be contained there. Uh, I do realize that there's a shaft leading into this third chamber. 
Is it possible that some of the gases move into that third chamber? Sure, again, I'm not saying that this conversion process is perfect, nor is it as effective as the one that we have today, but the mere fact is that they had the conversion process and they were doing this chemistry. So the next step in the process is again, raise that water level. Same thing you did in the first chamber, you're gonna do in the second chamber. So you raise your water level again. First step is to raise it to the height of the connecting shaft, which isolates the remaining interior space of the second chamber, which again is gonna set your initial temperature and pressure conditions inside the chamber. Next step is you're gonna start raising up that water level and you're gonna raise it again to the third tier in the vault. That's indicated here by the staining. Now I am leaving out something very, very important <laughs> in terms of the operation of this structure. Um, it is intentionally reserved for the second book in the series. So again, the first book is just your initiation into this ancient chemistry, describing some of the simple physics that were utilized in the chemical conversion process. But there are some more details that will be revealed in the second book in the series. Again, very, very exciting stuff that is, um, well, I won't say anything else about it. <laughs> I don't want to spill beans too early, but uh, you guys are really going to like it. If you think this is interesting, just wait until you hear what I have in the second book in the series. And again, it's probably going to be the second of many books. So work in progress, right? So raising the water level again, as the water level continues to rise in this second chamber, you are eventually going to reach the seventh tier in the vault. Again, remember that that eighth tier is at that 33 foot mark. So the water will not go any higher than that eighth tier. So as you reach the seventh tier, the water is filling this second chamber. The water is gonna to start to move through this shaft into the final chamber. Now there's a big pit at the bottom of this final chamber. Um, there are some indications that a floor has been removed from that chamber. And again, I might be talking about that a little bit more in the second book or some subsequent videos. Um, <clears throat> We'll leave that as the subject for another video. But nonetheless, as the water again rises up to the seventh tier, the water level is gonna to start to flow or the water itself is gonna run into this final synthesis chamber. It's gonna fill up the pit. So as that pit fills, your final synthesis chamber is also gonna to start to fill with water. Again, remember your Pascal principles, the water is gonna to continue to rise, right? And as you hit that eighth tier, your hydrogen, and carbon monoxide are going to be confined within the upper portion of this vault. Because again, the water level inside the chamber has reached the height of the water level in the exterior reservoir. And it can't go any higher than that. So what do you do? You also have to remember that there is the pump shaft leading down into the chamber. And this pump shaft is also gonna be filled with water. So you're gonna have water in your pump shaft. All you have to do is insert a stone block into the pump shaft. And again, if you break down the Egyptian pyramids into individual units of a chemical manufacturing process, you could begin to understand how these components were integrated into a chemical production process. Again, so that northern shaft is your pump shaft. It is used to compress the water, right? So you have your pump shaft here, it's filled with water. You have your water level inside the chamber. You move the block down your pump shaft, which raises the water level inside the chamber. So that's not only how you were going to initiate the conversion process of your hydrogen and carbon monoxide into several other chemicals, but that's also how you're gonna move them into the final synthesis chamber. So again, as you compress those gases, the hydrogen and carbon monoxide, into the upper vault. You've also got air in the chamber, right? Mostly oxygen and nitrogen. And those are your other two chemical ingredients in this stage of the chemical reaction process where your hydrogen and carbon monoxide are going to react with the oxygen and nitrogen in the air to produce hydrogen, nitrogen, water, and carbon dioxide. Now, in this stage of the reaction sequence, the carbon dioxide and the water are your undesirable byproducts, which coincidentally happen to be water soluble. Obviously water is gonna dissolve into the water. So let's say you have a high pressure situation in the second chamber. You have your water 
and your carbon monoxide gas or carbon dioxide gases being created, both which are soluble in water. So those are going to dissolve into solution. So your undesirable byproducts of the water and carbon dioxide dissolve into solution here in the second chamber, which leaves your hydrogen and nitrogen products, which are then moved into the third chamber. So it's it's very, very simple physics that, again, the chemistry that they accomplish utilizing these simple techniques is pretty miraculous. And it never ceases to amaze me. I've read this book. <laughs> so I've read my book probably two or 300 times already. <laughs> and um, it's still fascinating to me. It's so exciting to do these videos and finally put all of this material out here in kind of a different format. So anyway, again, you're compressing that hydrogen and carbon monoxide with the air into the upper portion of the chamber. Your two byproducts, which again are gonna be carbon dioxide and water are gonna dissolve into solution. So you're eliminating them from the reaction. And then you're going to continue to push your stone block down that Northern pump shaft. And it's gonna move your bubble of gases because that water level is gonna rise in the chamber. It's gonna push those gases in through the connecting shaft into your third and final synthesis chamber. So you're starting to get your nitrogen and hydrogen products into this final synthesis chamber. So after that step is complete, the cycle within the first two chambers is repeated. So you're not gonna get very much within that first one, so you repeat it enough to get this final synthesis chamber filled with nitrogen and hydrogen. And then that's when you activate, um, well, the third and final synthesis chamber to uh, get your final product. So let's get right to it. All right, so here is a picture of the northern wall of the second chamber. So again, you can see here that right at the base of this third tier is where that chemical, or well, the staining transition rather, because again, you have this kind of drippy staining on the lower section of the vault and all around the walls of the chamber. And in the upper section, you have this very dark nebulous type staining, very cloudy looking staining. And it gets darker and darker as you get into the upper portion of the chamber. And there's actually a transition. You have a transition at the third tier and then a transition at the eighth tier where, man, it's almost black in that upper portion of the chamber. But again, I'll get into the specifics as to why that is the case in a future video and in the second book in the series. But again, you can see here, there is a very distinct transition at that third tier. And this, uh, so that last picture was from 2020. This one is from 2017. This is just the stairway leading up to the upper vault of the second chamber. And this is how you get into that final synthesis chamber. You take this stairway on up there and there's a little shaft that leads from the upper vault of the second chamber into kind of the pit of the final synthesis chamber. And this is the connecting shaft that leads from the upper vault of that second chamber into the final synthesis chamber. Again, there's a pit down in here. You can just keep this ball rolling. And even in the modern process for ammonia production, oh, there, I just spoiled the secret, right? Of course, it just says it right here down at the bottom for anybody that was looking at the freaking diagram. <laughs> All right, so the Land of Chem logo, obviously there's ammonia inside the Red Pyramid. Red Pyramid reeks of ammonia. Ammonia is a ubiquitously useful industrial chemical. And what were they using it for mostly? Fertilizer, right? Because this is a massive agricultural civilization and they would have needed fertilizer to produce more crops, to keep their civilization growing. The more people you have, the more food you need, the more chemicals that you can utilize in terms of production of agricultural materials. So again, I believe they were creating ammonia um, for fertilizer same uh, use that we have for it today in our modern um, industrial society. So, but nonetheless, you can see here that even in our modern process, the CO2 removal process, right? Taking that CO2 out of the reaction is still accomplished with water today. Again, they have sort of some compressors and other things that they use to remove that, but that's exactly what you see utilized in the operation of the Red Pyramid is that that water and water soluble carbon dioxide product that's produced in the second chamber actually dissolves into solution and then is removed from the reaction system. 
So one thing I forgot to mention, um, the final step of that reaction process. So again, you're filling your final synthesis chamber with nitrogen and hydrogen. After that is complete, then you drain the first and second chambers to remove that water that now contains dissolved carbon dioxide. And that is a very important byproduct, which is not wasted as nothing was wasted with these ancient civilizations. You can see here on this diagram that it's actually transported offsite, this water that contains the dissolved CO2. And we're actually gonna see that utilized uh, in a further future structure. We'll talk about that later, but they didn't waste the carbon dioxide because that's again, another important chemical. But again, they're using very similar techniques more simple, yes. Uh, was it as efficient? No, but they were still doing it. And that's the whole point of this. Uh, so let me go back here a little bit. So the next stage in the process, well, it's just your conversion of your hydrogen and nitrogen into ammonia. So that is what was occurring here in this final synthesis chamber was again, that final stage of the chemical conversion that produced your ammonia gas. And in the modern reaction process, they're actually gonna be utilizing uh, ammonia liquid, but here it would have been gaseous ammonia. And I will describe how that was created and collected once this video catches up. All right, so now we're back. All right, so you have your hydrogen and nitrogen that are produced in the second chamber. Those hydrogen and nitrogen um, molecules are moved into the final synthesis chamber you fill your final synthesis chamber up with the hydrogen and nitrogen. And then what do you do? Because you also have to increase the temperature and pressure of these gases. But we know that the water level inside the chamber will only reach the height of the water level in the exterior reservoir unless it's manually manipulated. But again, that's what you use that northern pump shaft for to compress the water inside the chamber to get the water level to rise. And that's exactly what you have here is as that final synthesis chamber is filled with nitrogen and hydrogen. Again, you're gonna refill the entire structure. You're gonna pump or press rather, press that water using the Northern press shaft or Northern pump shaft. And that block reaches the bottom of this shaft. The water level within that final synthesis chamber will also have risen. because It doesn't have anywhere else to go. So again, you're pressing it down and it moves up into the upper portion of that final synthesis chamber. So this is the Western wall in the final synthesis chamber. And you can see here that there's plenty of staining in the upper portion of the vault, but very little staining on actually the Eastern wall of the chamber, which is a bit unusual, but again, it's kind of an indication of some flow dynamics that are pushing the reaction through the structure. And I think it's also a result of something that I'll be discussing in the, the next book in the series. This is a photo of the pit at the bottom of the chamber. Again, there are some indications that there's a shaft system leading out of the bottom of this chamber. I believe it goes right out of the bottom. There's a circular stone at the bottom of the chamber that almost has this, what looks like a nipple on top of this stone. It's a big circular stone that kind of has a nipple on top of it, which is very unusual in a structure that's composed of, well, remotely like your cubicle shape, right? Uh, most of these blocks are square shaped. So it's very unusual that you have this kind of disc state shaped stone sitting at the bottom. I think the shaft goes right out of the bottom, but there's also been some excavations to the side of the chamber where they started to tunnel in looking for a shaft system. And it just appears to be a dead end, but it also kind of looks like it's filled with concrete down in there. So, but nonetheless, this is the pit of the final synthesis chamber. Again, as your water is moving from the second chamber through the connecting shaft, it's gonna fill up that pit. So the water in the pit is gonna rise, the water level in the second chamber is gonna rise. And then again, you insert that block into the Northern pump shaft, which pushes everything up in the entire system, which is exactly what you have here in the final synthesis chamber. And you can see here the pit in the final synthesis chamber. So the nitrogen and hydrogen are compressed by the water into the upper vault of the final synthesis chamber further increasing the temperature and pressure and producing a reaction that generates ammonia gas. The reversed reaction of ammonia breaking back into hydrogen and nitrogen 
is prevented by immediately collecting the gaseous ammonia being produced. Ammonia gas is highly soluble and rapidly dissolves into the water below, creating an ammonia solution. So this quote from page 21 uh, by Brother Julius describes that final stage of the conversion process. So you have your final synthesis chamber filled with hydrogen and nitrogen gas. Again, you're utilizing that northern pump shaft to press the water into the upper vault of the chamber. Your nitrogen and hydrogen gases are gonna be compressed into that converging vault portion, increasing temperature reaction, um, increasing temperature and pressure and creating a chemical reaction that produces this NH3 gas. So again, ammonia, highly soluble, but also very, very easily breaks back down into its constituent parts of nitrogen and hydrogen. So that is pre prevented by immediately collecting the product. And again, if this ammonia gas is highly soluble, as soon as you create the ammonia gas, it's gonna dissolve into the water that's already in the chamber, creating an ammonia solution. So this is how they prevent, again, that breakdown of the ammonia back into its constituent parts. And it also encourages the forward momentum of the chemical reaction process, because if you're constantly collecting the product, the hydrogen and nitrogen can react more easily. And again, all of that product just gets dissolved as soon as it's created, you have your ammonia solution being created below, and then you extract it from the final synthesis chamber. So again, here's just a diagram on your left of kind of the modern day process for ammonia production. And you can see how reminiscent it is of the configuration of the red pyramid. Again, it's, it's crazy. When I started to stumble across these diagrams and started to compare what I thought was going on inside the red pyramid and what I knew was going on in the modern industrial ammonia process, it is remarkable how similar these two things are. And the science and the physics that was utilized in the operation of this ancient structure is very similar to what we have today, but again, we're um, expediting the production cycle by using electricity, higher temperature, higher pressure, which increases the yield and purity and all those kind of other things. Um, but again, the ancient people were doing it and they had structures that could do it and they utilized sophisticated construction techniques. Again, by engineering those chambers with the progressively reduced volume towards the apex of the chamber, they were able to, again, reduce that volume, increase the temperature and pressure, and utilize the physics to create these chemical reactions. And again, just imagine that this, so the nitrogen and hydrogen, nitrogen from the air, hydrogen from the natural gas, the methane that we had created from the step pyramid, moving through that chamber, moving through that shaft into the final synthesis chamber, and then being collected here as an ammonia solution, not liquid ammonia, but rather an ammonia solution, which is two very, very different things. Um, again, the ancients were utilizing the tools at their disposal, again, to create the ammonia gas and let it dissolve into solution. It's a much easier way to collect it and then get it out of the structure. And then your final step is just draining your final synthesis chamber. So as soon as that ammonia solution is created, you can drain it out from this final synthesis chamber through that shaft at the bottom of the chamber, out of the pyramid for collection, and then also remember, you still have your carbon dioxide solution, which is created in the second chamber. And that's going to be utilized later in the production process. So it may be a little easier for you to see this as a two-dimensional diagram. So again, imagine that this reservoir on the exterior of the facility here is about 33 feet high. And I have one more slide that I'm going to share that's a little bit of a um, well, I have another project in the works, let's put it that way, but I want to give you kind of a surprise about that. Um, so again, the water level, starting back with that first step, is going to fill the connecting shaft. It's going to fill the bottom part of that northern pump shaft. The water will continue to rise in the chamber. I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but I'm just trying to show where this water level would go to. Your methane and water are compressed into the upper vault of the first chamber, producing hydrogen and carbon monoxide lower the water level. Again, the gases move into the second chamber. Second chamber is your steam reformer where you use oxygen and nitrogen for the air to create carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide and water are dissolved into solution, removed from the chemical reaction sequence. And your hydrogen and nitrogen products then move, once you insert that block into the northern pump shaft, they're moved into the final synthesis chamber, where again, 
reducing the volume of the gases, increasing temperature and pressure, facilitates the chemical reaction producing ammonia gas. Ammonia gas dissolves into solution and then is collected out of the final synthesis chamber. So again, here's just kind of a little um, preview of a project that I have in the works. Um, I won't spoil the specific details, but let's just say that when I envisioned the operations of these structures when I was writing the book, I always wanted to see uh, you know, 3D models of these things in operation. And I was uh, drawing this picture for someone so they could see exactly how the structure works. But nonetheless, you have your reservoir here on the outside, which is 33 feet high. This is kind of the chamber filling process. This is your northern pump shaft. And again, I won't go too much into that. I won't spoil the surprise because that will be coming out sometime, hopefully soon. Um, again, these things take some time and good things come to those who wait, well, all of us included. <laughs> all right, so I think we've gotten to the end of this video. <laughs> I may or may not have to edit some of that stuff out where my computer just crapped out and decided to freeze for a second, but such is the nature of dealing with any technology. And so far, we have given an introduction to the land of chem. I think I actually did two introductory videos. We had episode three, which covered the function of the step pyramid, which you see here in the top left. So the step pyramid was producing methane gas, and that was the first stage in the sequence of chemical manufacturing facilities that were constructed on the western bank of the Nile River in Egypt. Next, we have moved on to the Red Pyramid of Dashur, which was creating ammonia. So you have methane, you have ammonia. Uh, what is next in the chemical reaction process? Well, you'll have to wait and see for the next video. Um, all right, <laughs> end of the video, man. I always get really, really excited. <laughs> so thank you all so much for sitting through another video with me. I really, really enjoy making these things definitely drop a comment if you have any questions, suggestions, just general feedback. I am genuinely interested in hearing what you have to say, whether you love it or you hate it. Let me know. Either way, I'm still going to keep making these videos. If you're interested in buying the book, it is available via digital download at www.thelandofchem.com. Of course, also check out the merch link at the bottom of the homepage if you're interested in getting yourself a Land of Chem t-shirt. Again, this is a 45, 45, 90 degree triangle, which represents the Red Pyramid, and you have your ammonia molecule, molecules inside the structure, uh, which to me, I use the hashtag greatest secret of all time, right? It, the secrets of the Egyptian pyramids to me are the most fascinating things on the planet. And it's just a really cool thing to be able to wear it as a t-shirt. I love these things. I'm very happy with the design. I'm gonna have a lot of other um, designs coming up and several more updates to that merch store coming soon. So stay tuned. Again, www.landofchem.com and definitely follow me on Instagram. <laughs> I have tons of pictures um, from all of my research expeditions, 2017 research expedition to Egypt, 2018 research trip to Ireland, um, I always kind of forget to mention that the final chapter in the book, Aquarius goes back to Ireland to investigate the ancient structures of that country. And it's a very interesting tie-in. I won't, again, won't spoil the surprise. I love the last chapter, <laughs> one of my favorites in the book. And then again, also pictures from my most recent trip to Egypt in November of 2020. So follow me on Instagram. Again, thank you guys so much. It means the world to me that you're interested in this stuff. And um, without further ado, again, I'm your host and the author, Jeffrey Drum. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>